We have uh, two very special speakers with us today, Whitney Tilson and John Hines. Uh, Whitney and John have collaborated together for over a decade, uh, putting together one of the most uh, well-regarded uh, value investing newsletters, Value Investor Insight. Uh, more recently, they collaborated and uh, put their years of investing wisdom and experience in investing uh, into a new book called The Art of Value Investing, How the World's Best Many Managers Beat the Markets. Uh, in addition, Whitney is also the fund manager for the Case Fund, which has uh, beaten the markets uh, by a considerable margin since inception uh, in 99. So we are very pleased to have both of them here share their wisdom with us. Uh, please help me welcome John, and then uh, Whitney will uh, follow on from there. Yeah, I think I OK, well, thank you all for coming. Um, just to talk a little bit about the plan for today, I'm going to start out and kind of give a Cliff Notes version of our book. Uh, and then Whitney is going to talk in a little more detail about one of the fundamental concepts that any investor has to master, which is how to value a stock. Um, and he's going to use a, an example as a case study of a stock that I think might be of passing interest, which will be Google. So what we tried to do with the art of value investing was pose all of the questions that someone who was, wanted to be a serious equity investor, all of the questions that, that that person should ask and answer for themselves before they commit their own capital or someone else's capital to doing so. And those questions are, it's a variety from, from soup to nuts. You know, what is my philosophy? What types of situations am I going to look at? Um, why are those situations uh, ripe for inefficiency, being inefficiently priced? How many stocks am I going to own? So we, we wanted to cover just about everything you should, you should answer before you start investing, uh, both from a kind of technical standpoint, but also from a psychological standpoint. What are the, what are the pitfalls that I might fall in that I should watch out for uh, as an investor because investors are, are prone to doing so? So for the answers to the questions, we, we used uh, the investors that we've spoken to over the last 10 years for Value Investor Insight. You know, we, we, every issue has two in-depth interviews with money managers who have successfully beaten the market. And we thought that was the, rather than us pontificating about uh, what we thought was the right thing to do, we, we listened to them. And what we also did is we didn't, we didn't assume that there was just one right answer to any of these questions posed. You know, money managers have different styles, they have different philosophies, they have different focuses, and you can be success successful with a lot of different focuses. So we wanted to provide kind of the diversity of opinion, and we thought that diversity of opinion would help people who were trying to arrive at their own philosophy and strategy come up with that. So I'm going to just go through a couple, uh, you know, again, not at all comprehensive, but I just wanted to, to talk about a few things that we cover in the book, uh, hopefully to convey some useful information and you know, prompt some, some thoughts on your, on your part. So it is called the art of value investing. So while we have a diversity of opinion, the, the underlying philosophy of all the investors that we talk to is a value investing philosophy. And you, you, you guys, you're all here, so you probably have some sense of what value investing is. But uh, you know, there, there are core principles to value investing, which we lay out in the book. Uh, I think a lot of it's captured pretty well in this quote from Will Brown, from Tweedy Brown. Our entire process is rooted in Ben Graham's simple philosophical framework for investing. He believed there were two values for every stock, the first being the current market price, and the second, what the share would be worth if the entire company were acquired by a knowledgeable buyer or if the assets were liquidated, the liabilities paid off, and the proceeds paid to stockholders. He called that the intrinsic value and argued that the time to buy was when there was a large spread between the current price and that value, and the time to sell was when the spread was narrow. Over time, we've developed different ways of applying that by valuing income streams rather than just assets, by calculating private market values, by investing internationally. But the essence of what we do has remained consistent. Our work every day is essentially directed at valuing what businesses are worth. Now, that's, that may seem kind of obvious, but the, the ability to value a company intelligently is not a trivial exercise, but it is kind of the, the fundamental 
thing you have to master and you have to do well to be a successful, to truly be a successful investor. That's not to say there aren't other reasons why people buy stocks. You know, people buy stocks because, well, my wife works at the company I think is a great company, or I love the product, or I heard at a cocktail party that it was going to go up. Lots of stocks get bought that way, but that's not what fundamental value investors do. So one of the, one of the first concepts we talk about is the, this notion of circle of competence. And that is what are the, every investor should think about, okay, what are the industries? What are the situations? What are the geographic areas? What are the size of companies that I'm going to look at and I'm going to become an expert in uh, that will allow me to, to, to get an edge over what is a, on a, what is a very uh, efficient market? Um, and I think the, the, the Basic concept is explained really well in this quote from Julian Robertson, who's a, one of the best, most successful hedge fund managers of all time. A baseball player never really gets paid, no matter how many home runs he hits or what his batting average is, unless he gets to the big leagues. Then he's guaranteed to make a lot of money. But in the fun business, you can find a minor league where you can hit for a better average because that's what you're paid on. I remember one of our guys taking us into Korea in the early 1990s, and the market was so inefficient that it was a gold mine if you knew what you were doing. My point is that to be successful in this business, you don't have to be better than everybody everywhere, just better than everybody in the league in which you play. It's maybe today more difficult to find those inefficient areas, but it's not impossible. So the central conceit of, of any investor is that you figured something out that the market doesn't know. You know if, if the, uh, or the market has just got wrong. Uh, if, if, What's priced into the stock is just what everybody assumes and what the consensus is. It's very unlikely that that stock is going to be a successful investment. The price reflects the future as the consensus sees it. So, and I think that that's something I think people don't, it's like, okay, Google is a great company, but that doesn't always mean that the investing in Google stock is a great investment. It may be that uh, the market is, is so enamored with Google's future that the price you'd have to pay to own a share of Google uh, isn't a value and uh, it won't be a great investment. That doesn't mean it's not a great company and it won't still perform extremely well, but, but it may not be a great investment. So I think one quote that captured that kind of notion really well, which is really important, uh, was from the publisher of the Daily Racing Forum of all places. He said, the issue is not which horse in the race is the most likely winner, but which horse or horses are offering odds that exceed their actual chances of victory. There is no such thing as liking a horse to win a race, only an attractive discrepancy between his chances and his price. Okay, so that puts a premium on what successful investors often call the variant perception. You know, actually knowing what it is or, or identifying what you think are the reasons a stock is mispriced. You know, you could, a lot of investors may just imagine, okay, I, the stock is cheap uh, and that's eventually going to, uh, to work its way out. But I think what, what we found is that a lot of the best investors go beyond that and they wanna know, they wanna know why, they wanna understand at least why it's cheap. Why, why would this be cheap? What's going on that could make this cheap? And that, uh, is the subject of this quote uh, that I thought said it pretty well from Curtis McGuinn, who's at Ivory Capital. Why something is mispriced is too often ignored by value investors. The general thinking is that it doesn't really matter. If you're right that something is mispriced, it will eventually take care of itself. We think it matters because you can conceivably avoid a lot of pain waiting for truth to prevail if you have a good read on why it currently doesn't. So again, that's uh, just to reiterate a little bit, it's, it's uh, just because something, a, a company is a good company doesn't mean it's a good stock investment. There has to be something about your perception of how of the assets they have or how the future is going to play out that differs from what everybody else thinks and what's, what's built into the stock price. Uh, so uh, logical question following that would be, so why do stocks get mispriced? You know, it's an it's efficient market. There are a lot of people who will, academics will tell you that it's an it's, it's a extremely efficient market and it's, it's, you should not even try to beat the market. So what, a, what a, value, a fundamental value investor who is an active manager is trying to do is identify what's going on that could make this, this stock cheap. And I thought that was summed up pretty well in this quote from Steve Marr of New South Capital. 
We believe the market often misprices stocks due to neglect, emotion, misinterpretation, or myopia. So our value add comes from bottom-up stock selection. We're trying to buy at low prices relative to our current estimate of intrinsic value, and we want to believe that intrinsic value will, will grow. So neglect, emotion, misinterpretation, or myopia. Those are the types of things that can lead a stock not to reflect accurately what's going on in the future. Um, Howard Marks of Oak Tree Capital, who is a longtime, very articulate uh, investor, uh, puts it this way in a more general way. Investment markets follow a pendulum-like swing between euphoria and depression, between celebrating positive developments and obsessing over negatives, and thus between overpriced and underpriced. There are a few things of which we can be sure, and this is one. Extreme market behavior will reverse. Those who believe the pendulum will move in one direction forever or reside at an extreme forever eventually will lose huge sums. Those who understand the pendulum's behavior can benefit enormously. So what kind of situations can lead to neglect, emotion, misinterpretation, or myopia, and therefore potentially inaccurate stock prices? A lot of things can make that happen, but there tends to be change. There tends to be uncertainty, and quite often there tends to be a problem or multiple problems. You know, these are things that, are, that can throw off uh, or, or cloud what the future may hold to a greater degree than, than if everything's kind of going OK. Um, again, uh, I'm, I'm doing this because I think the people that we interviewed say it better than I would. So uh, I'm going to quote uh, John Jacobson from Highfields Capital, where he talks about where he looks for opportunities. So what is, what is the fertile ground for potential mispricing? Two kinds of events create volatility, which creates opportunity. The first revolve around individual companies, such as earnings misses, unexpected news, M&A activity, restructurings, and legal issues, things that can make prices and valuations change relatively quickly. We want to understand what made the price change and then figure out whether the facts have changed as much as the price. To the extent they haven't, that can be an opportunity. The other major source of volatility is when a macro event or trend causes markets to move. The market reflects at any moment what investors think XYZ businesses, XYZ's business is worth. So if macroeconomic factors force people to buy and sell its securities, but we believe those factors have nothing to do with the underlying fundamentals of the company or less to do with the fundamentals than is being reflected in the share price, that can also be an opportunity. I mean, you guys probably know, even looking at Google stock, if you look at the uh, Google stock chart over the last five years, you'll see it, it moves. It moves quite a bit, and it moves a lot more, one could argue, than the actual fundamental reality of what's going on at Google at any given time. And it's that, you know, it's that if, if this is what's going on at Google at any time and this is the stock price, there can be opportunities to, to buy the stock when it's uh, uh, inefficiently priced. So while most discussions of stocks talk about what can go right about a stock, you know, everybody's talking about what's the upside, how, you know, this is going to be great, it's going to double. Um, one thing that I think distinguishes value investors somewhat is that they pay a lot of attention to what could go wrong. What's the downside? And that's well captured in this, this quote from Reagan Steinke of Westwood Management. The very first thing we do when we start to analyze a company is to ask ourselves how far the stock price would fall if we were wrong. It's not some back of the envelope calculation, but a full assessment looking at liquidation asset values and stressing the business model and valuation levels under any number of bad scenarios. If the downside is more than 30% from today's price, it's unlikely we'll invest, regardless of the upside potential. If we can't establish a concrete downside number, which probably means it isn't far from 100%, we absolutely won't buy the stock. Going through this first sets the tone we want to set in our research. Rather than start out looking to convince ourselves why we should buy something, we start out trying to prove why we shouldn't buy it. We try to keep that level of skepticism alive throughout the process. I think that's, that is a, that's a hallmark of value investors, that, that kind of, you know, any investor has to have some optimism. You wouldn't invest if you, if you weren't optimistic about a company's prospects. But skepticism is a kind of a hallmark, I think, of a, of a good investor and, and really thinking about what could go wrong. You know, yeah, it's great if a stock could double, but if that stock could go to zero, you should, you should think about that. Okay. Um, so Whitney will speak in more detail about how smart investors go about determining what a stock is worth. But even if you're able to do that well, there are a lot of things that can trip you up as an investor. Um, and a lot of that revolves around 
anything doing with money can set off all kinds of, of irrational responses on people's parts. You know, it could be you're assuming that what just happened is what's going to happen forever. Uh, or you're, you're panicking because uh, your stock went down and it feels really bad to have, have money evaporate like that. Um, it could be that you're, you're only looking for evidence that confirms what you already believe and you're really ignoring evidence that, uh, that disconfirms what you already believe. So these are the types of things that can throw people off and this is the reason why it is so hard to beat the market. People make a lot of uh, behavioral and emotional mistakes. And I think you know, one of the things that sets really good investors apart is they're able to deal with that pretty well. However they do it, whether it's just innate wiring or it's, it's you know, they've learned it over time, you have, to, you have to, to control your basest instincts somewhere. And uh, you know, there, I have a couple quotes here from two very long time, very successful investors, one of which is, one of whom is Seth Klarman of the Baupost Group. As Graham Dodd and Buffett have all said, you should always remember that you don't have to swing at every pitch. You can wait for opportunities that fit your cr criteria, and if you don't find them, patiently wait. Deciding not to panic is still a decision. Uh, and that's just, I mean, you, everyone's probably felt it. Like when, when things are going, if you, live, if you were an investor and you lived through uh, 2008, 2009, it feels really bad. You know, reading the paper was really hard, and it feels bad, and there is a, there is a really strong uh, tendency in those cases to just want to get out, make it, make the pain go away, and that's you know, it's perfectly natural. It's, it's, it's evolutionary in a lot of ways, but it's it's not it's not the greatest thing to do as an investor. You know, the the uh, the person who panicked and sold in March of 2009 and then was so scared that they they haven't gotten in for the last uh, five years. That's a, they've left a lot of money on the table, and that's a big mistake. Um, there's just another quote from a, a guy who is a very long time investor. He's in his 70s, and he still, he still really does well. And he just very matter of factly said, I honestly don't feel any of the emotional ups and downs from the market's day to day activity. I just don't worry about short term volatility. I think that's something as an investor you have to learn how to, to deal with. Um, I guess my last thought is just one about humility. You know, there's no question that confidence and conviction are essential elements to being a good investor. Um, but as we say in the book, you know, like like pepperoni pizza and fine scotch, too much of a good thing can can cause problems. Um, so the message is is not to ever think you've got it all figured out uh, as an investor, and that's probably true in life. But uh, you know, don't don't assume you've got it. You've got this thing nailed because the market uh, will inevitably humble you. Um, so here's a quote from Kyle Bass on that. You obviously need to develop strong opinions and to have the conviction to stick with them when you believe you're right, even when everybody else may think you're an idiot. But where I've seen ego get in the way is by not always being open to questions and to input that could change your mind. If you can't ever admit you're wrong, you're more likely to hang on to your losers and sell your winners, which is not a recipe for success. Uh, so I'm going to turn it now over to, to Whitney, who will try to shed some light on whether Google stock is uh, worth owning today. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining us. So um, uh, let's talk about uh, Google. And, um, I have a history here with uh, Google, and before I show it, uh, and uh, I run a hedge fund, started it, this is my 16th year. Uh, this is my uh, track record uh, after my usurious fees, net to investors. Um, and uh, the only reason I show it is I'm not here promoting uh, my fund, but rather I'm going to show you how spectacularly wrong I can be. Uh, uh, and I just want you to uh, not think I'm the world's stupidest investor. Um, so uh, very, very few investors uh, beat the market uh, over time. And uh, so I think it's a good track record. It's not a spectacular track record, but it's a good track record. Uh, very few managers have beat the market over a long period of time. I've done so, despite uh, every once in a while making a spectacularly bad call. So. Uh, a little over 10 years ago, in an article I wrote for The Motley Fool called The Tech Stock Opportunity, um, I wrote actually something reasonably smart here initially that, uh, that I think the tech sector offers fertile ground for value investors. Uh, a lot of great companies growing rapidly, uh, strong balance sheets, 
um, and very importantly, uh, a lot of crazy investors. Uh, if you are a sound and rational investor, you want to go to places, you want to compete with irrational people, right? Because they, uh, you know, a company misses an earnings estimate and they drop the stock 50% when the value of the company has not changed by 50% in all likelihood. Similarly, you want to buy something where the stock might rise back to intrinsic value, but then investors get euphoric and give you the chance to hang on and it'll trade at double or triple or quadruple intrinsic value. That's where you really make a lot of money, right? So, so uh, that's what I was pointing out here. But then I digressed uh, in this article um, to a company that had recently gone public um, named Google. And this is what I wrote about Google. And um, I said, there's a huge difference between uh, Dell and Google. Both are lumped into the tech sector. I would argue that Dell is primarily a manufacturing, assembling, sales, and service business, not a technology company. Dell doesn't care which hardware and software products wins the technology awards. Wars, it simply buys, assembles, and sells and supports whatever its customers want. So in short, I think the odds are very high, say 80 to 90 percent, that Dell is a major computer company in 20 years. And that actually has been proven, proven right, I think. Um, and by the way, I wasn't recommending Dell stock, which was very overvalued at the time, uh, and that was correct as well. However, then, eating crow, um, I said, Google, in contrast, a more typical tech company, one that must invest heavily to remain on the cutting edge, or its customers will quickly and easily flock to competitors. Just as Google came out of nowhere to unseat Yahoo as the leading search engine, so might another company do this to Google. I admire Google and what it has accomplished, but I'm happy, and I'm a happy user, but I'm quite certain that there's only a fairly shallow, narrow moat around its business. Making it worse, I then continued. Um, think about it. What are the odds that Google is the leading search engine in five years, much less 20 years? 50-50 at best, uh, I suspect. And I'd wager that odds are at least 90% that its profit margins and growth rate will be materially lower five years from now. Yet investors uh, appear ready to value this company as much as $36 billion. I guess this was on the eve of the IPO. Um, nearly 200 times trailing earnings. And by the way, about 12 times revenues. Google at the time had about $3 billion of revenues. Uh, ha! Um, Google with the same market cap as McDonald's, the stock I own. Ha! I believe it is virtually certain that Google stock will be highly disappointing to investors foolish enough to participate in its overhyped offering. You can hold me to that. <laughs> Remember John was just talking about humility? This is a business that keeps you humble. So, um, by the way, the, margin, um, the margins actually have sort of been stable, maybe even declined a little bit. Um, so I wasn't completely wrong that margins uh, would uh, become under pressure over time. Uh, but where I was uh, spectacularly wrong was the growth. Um, revenue has gone up more than 20x in the last 10 years. Um, it's been one of the most spectacular you know, growth uh, success stories uh, over time. Uh, so um, could, if you can go to the next slide. Um, so, um, and that is translated with a little decline in margins, but basically that growth has fallen uh, straight to the bottom line, and earnings from continuing operations um, have gone up to over $12 billion. That's translated into earnings per share uh, of, uh, excluding extra items, of almost $20 a share. Um, so not surprisingly, the stock has followed. Stocks over time tend to follow uh, the earnings, and uh, the stock has been approximately more than a 10-bagger since I uh, said it was wildly overvalued and should be avoided at all costs. So what did I miss? Um, and by the way, just as a general rule, there are a lot of companies out there today, small companies, $3 billion in revenues, uh, trading at 12 times, uh, 12 times revenues and 200 times earnings. Um, Salesforce.com has about $4 billion in revenues or so, trending toward 5.5 over the next year. Trades about 8 times revenues, 120 times next year's uh, earnings. Um, and so investors are sort of betting that that's going to look like Google uh, over the next 10 years or so. And I think the odds of that are extremely low. Um, in general, you guys are the outlier, right? As a general rule, 99 out of 100 companies that trade at such extreme valuations turn out to be lousy, if not catastrophic, investments. So I'm not convinced I was necessarily wrong to say a prudent value investor should probably not speculate in a, a, very, um, a very hyped IPO. Statistically speaking, it was probably pretty sound advice. But you guys were the outlier. You guys were the one in 100 that did pull it off. Um, so what did I miss? Um, I missed Google's moat. Um, it seemed to me that um, anyone could just easily switch and so forth. And theoretically, someone easily could. But on the other hand, 
people get into habits tend to be very sticky, and if you have a better product, you're constantly innovating, stay ahead of your competitors, that moat can build over time. Um, and there's, I missed the very powerful virtuous cycle at work with Google. Um, a large user base translates into a large advertiser base, better monetization, more R&D dollars, yielding a better product. Uh, which uh, a better product is a high barrier to entry, which then attracts more of a user base, et cetera. By the way, um, I made it nine times my own money in the last two years on Netflix. I was initially at one time shorted. And by the way, at least I was not stupid enough to short Google. Okay, So I've not, never lost any money on Google. I just haven't made any money on it. Um, Netflix, I was dumb enough to short. And then I came, because I thought you know, anyone can stream movies, whatever. And then I came to realize Netflix has a similar virtuous cycle going on, where they have 80% of the streaming customers in the world. They then take all that revenue and buy great content, which then attracts 80 to 90 to 100% of every incremental new streaming customer on Earth is joining Netflix, which they, they can reinvest in better content. And, and the price of admission now. Netflix is spending over $3 billion a year on content. The price of admission is now very, very high. Uh, even if a much bigger company, uh, Google, Amazon is trying to do it, if Google wanted to try and do it, it's now going to cost billions and billions of dollars. And from a company that's generating no revenue to even open your doors and start a service, you've got to license $3 billion worth of content. Whereas Netflix has 50 million paying subscribers paying for that content, right? So, you know, it's uh, Netflix I thought was a commodity business. It is looking like a winner-take-all business. You guys look like a commodity business, and I think in, in many of your areas, you are a winner-take-all business because of this kind of virtuous cycle. It's very, very powerful, and something I didn't appreciate 10 years ago. I appreciate it more today. So let's talk about the stock today. Um, uh, it's a couple days old at close today. It's right around three, uh, 537 right now. $368 billion market cap, you got a ton of cash, sliver of debt, $316 billion enterprise. Um, like most tech companies, um, a, a large expense is stock-based compensation. Accounting rules acquire, uh, require you to expense that as if it were cash, but it is a non-cash charge. So Google, like a lot of tech companies, um, analysts, they report earnings uh, excluding the stock-based comp. I tend to figure, I don't care if a company pays cash or dilutes me via options that are worth a certain amount of cash. So I tend to be pretty conservative. Uh, but these numbers will be lower, about $5 a share lower than the earnings per share numbers that you might see. Um, because about $5 a share of earnings are in non-cash. You guys are partially paid in options. Uh, so reasonable people can disagree about that. Um, if you want to X that out and use a EBITDA uh, number. Um, so you know Google's uh, trading right now at about 26 and a half times this year's price to earnings multiple, 21 times next year's. Those multiples, that would come down by a few points if you exclude stock-based comp, which most analysts do. Um, and then you know, uh, EBITDA numbers, uh, multiples as well. So what is it saying is, is it, we're in a market of probably 16 times earnings for the S&P 500. So any way you count it, you guys are at some premium to that, but not a crazy premium. Uh, but you guys are growing your revenues 20% a year. The average S&P company is growing their revenues you know, maybe 5% a year, right? So um, uh, you guys have massively higher margins, returns on capital, et cetera. So it's a far superior company trading at a premium price, but not a crazy premium price. Um, uh, so that's sort of interesting, right? Um, you know, I typically like buying out of favor companies where sentiment is extremely negative, stocks are uh, stocks near a 52-week low, et cetera, sort of betting on a stabilization and or a turnaround. That's typically what I do. But every once in a while, uh, you know, I bought Netflix after it crashed from 300 down to around $50 a share, right? Uh, when I thought, you know, look, if they can't fix the business, somebody should buy them for $3 billion, right? Uh, I think, by the way, Google has made a number of very savvy acquisitions over the years. I, uh, I, somebody should be kicking themselves at Google. You didn't buy Netflix when it was, had a $3.2 billion market cap. I mean, what a, uh, it, it was a great business. It is a great business. So, uh, so. Um, I, uh, um, I'm actually sort of intrigued with Google. The other thing, by the way, is, is it's, such a big, it's such a big company, but such a large market cap. It's hard to make a lot of money buying things with multi-hundred billion dollar market caps. I mean, just size is sort of an anchor, right? Uh, I run a pretty small fund, and I tend to, tend to look for smaller companies. But you know, it's pretty interesting. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued by Google. Uh, I'm going to do some more work on it. Um, so, uh, so let's just talk about last quarter's earnings. You guys have probably already seen this, but revenues grew 20%. Margins uh, got squeezed. Expenses rose a little faster than revenues, which squeezed margins. Uh, depending on one, w whether you want to look at non-GAAP or GAAP 
earnings. Earnings either went up or down a little bit. But the real questions to think about is, is can the company continue to grow at sort of at least sort of a high teens 20% rate? And will those margins at least stabilize? Um, and um, when you think about Google, by the way, if Google were to separate itself out and spin off um, you know, Google Fiber and the self-driving car stuff, like Google is a lot of those expenses are investing in things that are currently not generating any revenues, just straight out losses, right? Like if you actually one, I think a reasonable way to think about Google would be to sort of take out all the money losing stuff where you know these pie in the sky things where Google actually has a pretty darn good track record of developing really valuable things down the road whereas and I might give Google sort of credit for that and say you know how much is their core business really earning xing out all these expenses and you might actually it might bring those it might be a, quite a bit of expenses and you might actually say Google's core business trading for 15 times earnings or something like a market multiple and then you're getting like a free call option on stuff that you know self-driving cars if you guys nail that that could change the world like that's a that's a worldwide game changer right and you guys will own it you know so uh, I'm not sure I'd give Microsoft much credit for that they have a horrible track record of just pissing money away uh, over the years and projects and acquisitions that just create no value and as a you know, Microsoft shareholders are sort of rebelling right but you guys seem to be a lot better at that uh, and so so again you know that that would be the argument for uh, for owning Google stock is is that it's really not as expensive as it appears because they're expensing uh, a, a lot of their expenses their core business is actually even much more profitable than it appears one of the world's greatest businesses, and then they're investing in, uh, uh, in a lot of new stuff where there's likelihood to pay off. So this gives you a sense, by the way, again, what I sort of missed is, is companies that have a lot of optionality to get in new businesses, make acquisitions, et cetera. So this was the $3 billion revenues when I was disparaging the company. And the core business grew 10x. But then stuff that didn't even exist back then doubled to 20x revenue growth, right? So this is, this is cool, right? And if you think this kind of thing can continue, things that don't exist, don't generate a dollar of revenue today, like Google Fiber, self-driving cars, or whatever, and that this kind of thing continues again, um, you know, this stock may look really cheap today if, if, you can start, if you can develop some amazing stuff and start to monetize it. Uh, so I think this is the last slide, and then we can do a Q&A. Which is, you know, you just want to, if you want to make a case for the stock today, is is look at the pieces overall. You continue to grow your revenues 20% for the next four years. Um, if your margins uh, just stay flat, that means the the earnings go up 20% a year. That's a double in four years. A 20 multiple or so, um, if you can continue to grow at 20%, is a reasonable thing to assume. Might go up, might go down, but that's actually probably not unreasonable, and therefore the stock just follows follows that same trajectory. And um, you know, uh, making 20% compounded over the next four years isn't spectacular, but it's pretty darn good. Um, you know, if I if I thought this stock was very likely, with low low risk of downside, very likely to be a double in four years, I don't know all day. I own a real high quality company where I think I can double my money in four years. So. That's sort of what I'll be sort of digging into is, is because there are very few companies this size that can grow at that rate. You know, that can you know, already at $66 billion, already at a $300 plus billion market cap that can double again from there in four years. You know, that's, that's pretty rare, but you guys have been doing it. So uh, I certainly wouldn't bet against it. Um, the question is, is, you know, for a guy who only owns 15 stocks, is this one of the best 15 stocks in the universe I can find? That's, that's the real question. So with that, um, you want to come up, John? We can. Uh, we're happy to take questions. Uh, I like to ask you, like, how to learn from mistakes, right? So you said that, uh, okay, like you said that Google was one of your mistakes, but you also said that, like, uh, you know, like it's like buying a lottery ticket. Like, even if you win the uh, lottery, it doesn't mean that it was the right decision to make, right? So I just want to ask, like, like uh, if you make a wrong decision, like, uh, do you learn from it, or do you think, okay, this is just how it happens, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. It's hard. In the investing world, the analogy I would give you is, is, is if you walk through a dynamite factory with an open torch and you get through to the other side safely, was it a good idea? 
And the answer is, of course not. It is an idiotic thing to do. And the fact that you didn't die uh, was just good luck, right? But you should never do that again, right? So the investing world has a, you can learn a lot of false lessons in the investing world. You can make, you can totally screw up the analysis and make money. And by the way, you can do good analysis and lose money, right? So learning from mistakes isn't as simple as simply saying, well, did I make money or lose money? Because so you, the goal of investing is to make high probability bets. Um, and, but even the highest probability bets sometimes work against you, right? So um, the lessons, um, but here I do think um, one of the things I've learned, like I was trained as a traditional value investor in the Warren Buffett kind of school. You don't, talk, you don't look at tech stocks, et cetera, et cetera. And um, uh, I was trained to think about the competitive moats of companies, you know, Coke's brand or you know, Costco's low cost service or whatever. And what's happened in the last 10 years, the kind of companies that have been created that are almost like virtual companies that can grow very rapidly to become global companies with enormously high profit margins without the need to invest incremental capital, right? So you guys can grow to countries all over the world and you don't have to manufacture stuff. You don't have to ship it. You have no inventory. It, these are light business models that create returns on capital uh, at, on, at, a, at a rate and a scale and a scope, a global scope and a speed that has never existed in history. And it really requires you to, you can either just say, you can be like Warren Buffett and just say, I don't understand any of this and I'm just going to stay away. I'm not going to short it, not going to long it, go long it. I want to understand it because I plan to be investing for another 50 years. Um, and and so, my, so the real learning here from getting my head handed to me being short Netflix before finally appreciating it and making nine times my money, I flipped around. So in other words, my learning from getting killed on the short side is, is I went and did a lot more work. You know, losing millions of dollars focuses the mind, right? <laughs> and so losing millions of dollars forced me to rethink what I was missing here. Now, sometimes I w you're not missing something. Sometimes a short runs against you, and you're absolutely right, and you just got to be patient, and your thesis will eventually play out. Because being early and being wrong look the same, either long or short, right? But in the case of Netflix, you know, you got to keep an open mind. Uh, um, and and uh, I did keep an open mind in this case. Developed a much greater appreciation for the company. So when I covered, I, I was short it from 80 to 200. I covered my short. It went to 300. I felt pretty smart. Then it fell to f eventually to 50. Um, it fell 80 percent in a matter of about three months. And I want to kill myself because everything I predicted in my short thesis came true. And I said, "Wait, you idiot!" My learning was is don't get scared out of a short you have conviction in, right? But I, that actually wasn't the right learning, though, because Netflix was a massively better company than I thought. And the key pillars of my short thesis where there's no mode around the business and sort of wacky management and competitors are going to come in and eat their lunch, all of my pillars of my short thesis were wrong. I was right to cover no matter what happened to the stock. But what it did is, is by gaining appreciation for the company, I was ready to pounce when the stock collapsed. And so. So that was, that's a great example. I wish I, could, I wish I were that open-minded and learned and had great experiences like that more often. Um, uh, uh, um, so, so, um, so that's a good case study. Anything to add, John? I would just say a lot of it is, is understand why you made a mistake. You know, it may be that uh, you, know, you didn't really make a mistake. The analysis was good, it was sound, and then something else happened that, that made it go wrong. And so you shouldn't necessarily uh, you know, if you understand why you made the mistake, you shouldn't necessarily just n not do that exact same thing again next time. Sir, yeah, I have two questions. The first one is uh, your portfolio has about 15 stocks that's a very small number, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you screen like off the thousands of stocks? What are some like top like three or five factors you use as a filters? That's number one. Yeah. Number two is like my general impression is that the market tend to ignore like balance sheet items, right? Like just like a lot of cash investment, like a PE number, right? Totally no balance sheet. Uh, what do you think? How do you think about that uh, that issue? All right. Well, I use a four step. I actually have it taped to the wall next to my desk. My four step process is first, when I look at any new stock, is a circle of competence. Do I know something about this industry? Is it is it knowable? Is it is the future predictable? Here. Um, uh, so there's a there's sort of it's almost like a yes or no thing, right? There is some gray area um, where maybe I don't know it very well, but I think I can do some research and get to know. It. So circle of competence, then it's 
Um, it's do I like the company? Um, and I look at financial characteristics, cash flows, return on equity, et cetera. So I sort of evaluate the company. And by the way, I'll invest in sort of crummy companies if, if, if it's cheap enough, right? But ideally, I'm looking for higher quality businesses that I can compound over time. Then uh, I look at the industry because a good company in a crummy industry, eh, you know, uh, you know is, is going to struggle, right? Um, uh, so it's a company and industry management, uh, a company and industry analysis, then management. Um, and that's really important. Both do they run the business well, do they allocate capital well, um, and do they treat shareholders well? Um, and here's the thing. I can find right now, I can find hundreds of companies that I understand really well, great industry and company dynamics, wonderful management, treat shareholders great. So what's the problem? The stock's not cheap. Everybody else on earth can understand it and likes the company and the industry and the management. And therefore, the stock price reflects it. The real key is to then just sit there and sit there and sit there and sit there and be super patient until, you can, until I can find a situation where the stock price is well below what I think it should be based on my analysis. right? And usually what that requires is, is for there to be some, the market thinks one thing, the variant perception that John talked about. To make money investing, you only need to do two things. You uh, need to bet against the crowd, right? That's the easy part. And then you ha just have to be right. That's the hard part, OK? Because <laughs> the crowd is usually right. The crowd was right on Google. If anything, the crowd didn't appreciate Google enough, right? We now know stock was an 11 bagger. So that's the hard part. And it just means being super, super patient um, and recognizing that nine out of 10 times where you think your variant perception is right. Nine out of 10 times, the crowd is right. The crowd is very wise and powerful and smart because there are a lot of really smart people picking over. And every time you think, oh, this, stock, this company is a really great company and the stock's been unfairly beaten up, nine out of 10 times, you're wrong. The company's in full scale collapse and it's a value trap, right? So you know, what I try and do is you know, once a month, once every two months or three months, is this, you know, I look at a lot of different, lot of different things. You just, it's like a, it's like a a pitcher pitching to you in baseball. And you sit there, and there are no called balls or strikes. You can just sit there and take pitches all day long, and don't swing at anything that's a little iffy. Wait till just a, something that you just, in your gut, you know that, you know, I know I'm right on this one, and the market's wrong on this one. And that's when you swing. The second question was about balance sheets. I mean, is that your perception that, that uh I don't know if that's universally held, the idea that, that uh, balance sheet assets are ignored. I mean, actually, it's one of the, it is, it is a, uh, a way value investors, I think, find value, is that you know, there isn't a recognition, right? There isn't a recognition that, well, the, the, the stock's really pretty cheap when you take out the cash. Or it may be that there are assets on the books that are just wildly more valuable than they currently trade. So that, that is a, that's a typical way in which uh, investors do make uh, to assess something to be inefficiently priced. So I, I wouldn't say it always happens, but it, it, it certainly is a, it is a way to find value. Yeah. I mean, a lot of historically, the, um, Ben Graham was a balance sheet investor. Just buy things net nets, things trading at dis, uh, discount to readily ascertainable uh, liquidation value, excluding property, plant, and equipment, just like accounts receivable and cash, minus all liabilities, uh, et cetera. Um, and Buffett moved away from that, and for a very good reason. They tend to be super low quality companies, a lot of value traps, difficult to do if you're managing any kind of material pool of capital, because they tend to be nooks and crannies. Every once in a while, late, late 2008, early 2009, there are sort of statistically cheap on a balance sheet basis companies, um, where you could have gone in and just bought a basket of them and made quite a bit of money, but it's hard to do. Only once every 10 years does that sort of work. Um, so uh, usually during times of market panic, and at that point you're probably better buying. You're probably better off buying higher quality companies that you just don't buy for a quick double, but can you know if if all the stocks are really depressed, you can get a long run on them. Is there a question back there? Or, or here, go ahead with the microphone, and then you next. Yeah, thanks for the talk. I was wondering if you could add some commentary on books like A Random Walk on Wall Street or companies like Wealthfront, which talk about like well diversified. Uh, balanced portfolios as opposed to maybe trying to choose 15 uh, stocks yes. or whatever? Um, 
my, most of my recommendation for all of you would just be just buy some index funds and then you know hang on to some of your Google options or whatever. Uh, as long as you don't let it don't let it be eighty percent of your net worth, and all uh, in all likely is probably not a good idea. Um, but uh, you know my parents have some money with me, and they have some money in index funds, and um, it is hard. Boy, is it hard picking stocks um, and doing it without a lot of training and experience as a part-time thing is probably not a good idea. Um, you know, I, I don't try and r write code. <laughs> why, why should you guys try and pick stocks? Trust me, I know a lot more about it than you do, right? I spent 16 years getting scars on my backs, uh, you know, and I graduated from Harvard Business School and top of my class, you know, whatever, right? Like, I've got a lot of training plus a lot of experience. This is an experience-based business um, and very, very, and it's a business um, that, you know, 80 plus percent of people engaged in the business full time really don't know what they're doing and are going to do worse than an index fund, right? Um, and so it's, uh, uh, I'd like to think I'm sort of in the 20 percent uh, that has enough experience and enough training and sort of smart and clever enough uh, to, to do better for my investors um, uh, than index funds. But as a general rule, it's, it's, it's hard to pick stocks. It's hard to pick managers who are skilled at picking stocks over time because the, you know, I can tell you we've had a six-year bull market. There are a lot of bull market geniuses out there right now who've got, who have just been piling in to the most speculative stocks, and they've been rewarded for that. And so they have the best track records uh, over the last six years. Uh, and a lot of them weren't running money in 08. So the, the, the most important thing I tell you is that looking at a manager is, is look at how they did in 08, right? And that can tell you, you know, what kind of risk takers they are and how they might perform in a down market. But the problem is the average money manager hasn't been in business six years. Uh, and so therefore you can't see how they did in 08. So, so that's why, you know, uh, I'm, a, I, I'm a big fan of index funds. The, those books are right by and large, but there are also outliers that is not random. It, Warren Buffett's track record is not random. Uh, he's just that good. And there are some guys who are that good. I just finished your book, and, and it was very, very excellent. Um, one of the things I noticed is that a lot of these excellent stock uh, experts are very forthcoming with their ideas and their philosophy and, and very much in detail. And yet, it seems like the vast majority of people don't invest that way. So I was wondering if you based on your experience, what do you think are the three major uh, personality traits or qualities required to really uh, understand it and do it? And Because it seems to me that a lot of people think it has to do with being very good at math and so forth, but it seems like the psychological aspect and the discipline aspect is actually as important or maybe more. And I can start with that one. I, I, and that's what I would say is that I think what and I think even these great investors would say it's not because they are, uh, you know, they graduated first in their class at Harvard Business School. It's because they, it, it, they, they, have, they have a strategy, they have a philosophy that they believe will work, and it's credible that it, it will work. And they are able, through the discipline of their process, through the discipline of their buy and sell mechanisms, uh, they're able to, to stick with that through thick or thin, and that, that is really hard. You know, like Joel Greenblatt, he's quoted several times in the book, and he, you know, he talks about it's really hard, because you can be wrong for, you know, a lot of value investors are struggling now. You know, the market's gone up for, for five straight years, and so they're, they're struggling, they feel out of sync with the market, and you, you want to just fix that, but you, you, you have to resist that because fixing it means going against what your discipline is and what your process is and what you believe in. And uh, you know, so I think an ability through the hard times to stick with what you believe in and execute it without cutting corners in a real disciplined way, it's really kind of basic blocking and tackling, but I think that's what sets a lot of these people apart. I mean, obviously they're, they're very smart. You know, Warren Buffett always talks about um, you know, it's not the person with the highest IQ that wins in investing, but it, it, clearly Warren Buffett is pretty smart. So uh, yeah, it doesn't hurt. Right? Yeah. So this article I wrote uh, three years before the infamous Google article, um, July 2001, Traits of Successful Money Managers. I framed it into two things. To be a successful stock picker or money manager, you got to do two things. You have to have the right approach, and then you have to be able to the right temperament. You have to be able to execute. So you have to have the right sort of philosophy, right? So you're not trading electrons or whatever. You're buying companies 
Uh, you only buy when it's on sale. You sort of ignore the market, uh, focus on investing losses, uh, on avoiding losses. You know, only invest when the odds are in your favor. Don't worry about macroeconomic factors, et cetera, et cetera, right? And then, so you have to have the right approach, and then you have to be the right person. And so what does that mean? You, you know, you're a business person, and you're thinking about your buying businesses, as if you have the private equity mentality. You know, if I could buy this entire business for the market cap, at which I am buying one share of this business, that's what I would do. Um, you have to be really smart. You have to have a lot of intellectual horsepower for sure. But then, you know, once you reach a certain level, the ability to crunch numbers, mathematical ability, is of pretty low importance above a, a fairly basic level. Um, you, uh, it's, and then it comes to the mental stuff that you were talking about. So you have to be simultaneously confident and humble. Nobody gets into this business without a lot of confidence, right? It's just that's the nature of the business, right? Your track record is public. Anytime you're betting against a thousand, a million other people, that is an act of arrogance. The purchase of a stock is an act of arrogance because you're saying, I think I'm right, and all those million other smart people, and plus their supercomputers, are wrong. It's an act of arrogance, right? So you have to have that kind of confidence. But at the same time, you have to have the humility to recognize when something's outside your circle of competence, to recognize when, uh, if your investment thesis is wrong, and to accept disconfirming information and change your mind, and sometimes very publicly admit that you are wrong. Right? And then you have to just be really independent. Right? It doesn't matter if, the, if, the, if everybody else loves the stock, if everybody else hates the stock, you have to not care. Right? You have to do your own analysis value the company, and then buy it, be patient enough to buy it at sort of half that price. Uh, and lastly, sort of be patient, um, long-term greedy. Most human beings are hardwired to try and get rich quick. Who doesn't want to get rich quick, right? Um, it, you've got to have the patience to be willing to get rich slowly. Um, uh, and, and you will make money faster with the get rich slowly approach than with the get rich quick approach. Um, so, and lastly, I'll just say the people who are really good at this, they love what they do. Like I was talking with uh, Rishi earlier and said people here at Google, like a lot of the people I work with and so forth, they they love tackling challenging intellectual problems. They, they love what they do. They're not here for the money primarily. They love what they do. I can tell you in my business, the successful investors love what they do. It happens to be extremely lucrative. Um, and you know nobody minds the money, I suppose. But the, if you took away the money, Every single investor I know, the good investors, would still keep investing because they love the game, the challenge, the intellectual challenge, the, 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 the feedback you get fairly, in fairly short order, like if your analysis is right or not. I think there was a, a question back there. I don't want to miss, uh, miss your question. So um, I wanted to push a little bit more on the, one of the previous questions about practical advice. Mm -hmm. And I feel a little bit stuck because on one hand, value investing is super attractive, right? It sounds really attractive, like I want to do that. Uh, but I know I have a full-time job and I'm not an expert, so I won't do it myself. And then finding the right investor is another full-time job. And like you said, maybe I can't do that either. Then the alternative is to invest in, um, in index funds, and that's not value investing, right? That's the opposite of that. So that doesn't sound that appealing. And plus, you know, it worries me that when the, you know, the owners, the market is really just the mutual fund guys and the pension fund guys, and they have the wrong incentives, right? So when the market crashes, they're fine because everybody else crashes, and they all jump on the train when the market um, grows. And so I don't feel very well protected in those funds. Um, and so I feel kind of stuck. Um, and is that, should I just say, okay, until I'm super rich and I can invest in hedge funds and like, get the right advice to find the right ones, I just have to live with the index funds? Or you know, is there anything that's smarter for like, the average person? Average Google right, yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> with a full-time job, that's not an expert. I mean, I'll speak because I'm not a professional investor, but I am a very, I'm an active investor and I care a lot about it and I've always paid a lot of attention to it. And um, I would say a couple things. One, uh, I still uh, hold out the belief that, that there, are, there are people who can beat the market and that you can, with some work, you can identify who you think can beat the market. You know, that, that, and it's, it's clearly not easy. And if you look at academic studies of how well people do at that, it's not impressive. But personally, uh, you know, I have chosen to believe that, you know, just like there are 
are better brain surgeons and better airplane pilots, there are better investors. And you know, there are things you can look at in terms of what's their philosophy. You know, so a, a, a clear, uh, clearly articulated value investing philosophy that you know, run by people who have been through up markets and down markets and have over time performed extremely well, I'm still, I'm still willing to say I believe that that can beat an index fund. You know, so I'm not giving advice, I'm just telling you what, I'm, what I would do. So I believe, I believe you can do that. But you do have to, you have to have a philosophy, like you have to believe value investing makes sense. You have to be able, when you read all the materials that, that XYZ company value investing manage, money manager talks about, you have to really believe that they can do it, that they're describing a philosophy and a process and a, and a discipline that, that they can do it. That would be, I would talk uh, mutual funds because it's, those are available to everyone. So yes, there are, there are if, you, if you're a value investor, there are uh, you know, more passive value investing funds. You know? So there are, there are ETFs, you know, DFA, if you know that, that brand name, DFA funds. They, they will, they'll buy a ton of, ton of stocks, but it, it will, the factors will be value investing related factors. So you can have a very diversified portfolio, but it's value investing, which is, so it's, it's somewhat, it's in between like pure passive investing and pure active investing. So that's, that's an option. Um, so that's one thing I would say that the second thing I've learned since I've been doing this, I've been doing this for the last 10 years, is uh, I used to be, I used to have more individual stocks than I do now. I, I just partly because I enjoy it, and it's and I think my instincts are fairly good. But I have learned uh, in spending the last ten years talking to really smart investors that they should be a lot better at it than I am. I mean, they they should be. They they're spending their entire. I have a I have another job. They're spending their entire time doing it. And where I where I really fall down is uh, I think my instincts are good. On the buy side, you know, I can I can recognize a situation that I can understand why this is beaten down. I can have a contrarian opinion. I can have a variant perception, but where I'm a little bit lost is selling. I, I don't know when to sell. I, I'm the only way you can really know when to sell is if you are if you are on a regular basis valuing what you think the company is worth. Um, you know, and I'm I might just say, you know, I'll admit when he's talking about his stupid mistake with with Google. I, I had Apple stock in my son, who is now 22 years old, when he was born. I put it in his college savings fund. And I had Apple stock that did nothing for years. And then, and I'm thinking, oh, and I'm reading in Barron's that this, this stock, it, it's doomed. Nobody's going to use Apple products anymore. Uh, Microsoft has won. Um, and I'm holding this, this Apple stock, which was quite a bit at the time, and I was thinking, Okay, well, if anybody figures out this kind of interaction between technology and media, Apple has a chance at it, so I'm going to let that play out. So I'm flat for like five years. They launch the iPod. Stock goes from 10, rough, really, like 10 to 12. And I go, oh, wow, 20%, great, sell it. <laughs> and I calculated, I calculated, uh, a couple years ago, when the stock, I think, was maybe it was a year or so ago, the stock was about where it is now. And I calculated that, that my stake in my, my little baby's uh, uh, college fund would be worth $1.3 million. Wow. Uh, and so anyway, talk about trying to learn from lessons. You know, the lesson there was I actually was, I, I was pretty smart about Apple, uh, but I just had no idea how to think about when to sell. So anyway, that has, as a result, I have shifted way more of my kind of equity, personal portfolio of equities to, I, I still use actively managed funds, whether they're hedge funds or, or mutual funds. Uh, and I just, the, the, the piece I keep in individual stocks, I, re, I do it because I like it and it's, it's interesting and it's fun, uh, but it's not what I'm counting on living on in retirement. I'll just add three things to that. Um, number one, um, before you even think about investing, um, there's a great old book, you know, 15 years old, called The Millionaire Next Door. And it's a study of millionaires in this country. Um, and uh, it turns out being clever investors 
is like the least most important thing. The single most important thing is, is live beneath your means. If every year, it turns out teachers are far more likely to become millionaires than doctors relative to their income. Because for whatever reason, teachers tend to, my parents were both public school teachers so when I was born and uh, met and married in the Peace Corps and I've never earned very much. But we wore secondhand clothes. Uh, my parents never owned a new car their entire life. Uh, and uh, we didn't go out to eat a lot, and my mom's a good cook, and whatever. And, and so every year, they just salted away money. And you save money. And this is a very high cost of living area, right? Uh, but you know, there are ways to not be extravagant. Uh, and so single most important thing you can do for your long-term financial health is just live beneath your means. And you know, certainly don't be out on margin you know, with your credit cards paying 25% interest, right? So that's number one. Number two is, is um, uh, unless you really know a manager or a fund well or whatever, just there's indexing is actually a great option. Um, uh, I, if you ask me to pick a, a mutual fund to recommend to you, I know one mutual fund in, of the 8,000 mutual funds out there. There's only one I would recommend, um, and it's a guy I happen to know. Zeke Ashton runs the Centaur Total Return Fund or whatever. It's a relatively small fund, but I know him personally, and I would have confidence in him. And that's it. That's it. So just index. And I've been doing this 16 years, right? I mean. Uh, um, and then thirdly, you guys are sort of in an interesting position here. You guys have friends, you're in the heart of an incredibly vibrant, dynamic area with incredible companies, right? And I don't think buying Tesla or Netflix today is probably gonna be the wisest thing, or so Apple today, right? After they've run up 20X or more, right? But it's a volatile sector. Um, and to the extent a, uh, a particular company's stock gets killed or the whole sector gets killed, you guys are actually in a reasonable position if you talk to your friends and you look at where is the talent flowing. It is flowing out of Yahoo and into Facebook. And Facebook got killed post IPO and it went from you know, 50 or something down to 20 or something. Uh, you guys actually might have been able to figure that out, whereas I, I wasn't, right? Because I'm not out here, I don't know the people and all. But you know, Facebook, I think you guys have the second best business model in the world. I actually think Facebook may well have the greatest business model in the world, right? It's a winner take all business. It's one out of every six people on the planet is now a member, right? And it costs them nothing to add new members. There's zero incremental cost. So they just grow globally at no incremental cost. It's, and it's just pure profit. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty incredible. That business model never existed before. You guys have very similar dynamics. So it would be close, right? But compare that to a Tesla, which is I was stupid enough to short and then gained appreciation for it um, and think it's an incredible company. But you see, they actually have to make stuff. Right? And then they have to ship it and they have inventory, et cetera, et cetera. For them to grow, it's a very capital intensive process, right? They have nowhere near the business model you guys have, or Facebook has, right? So you guys, I would say, maybe take 20% of your portfolio and use your networks and relationships and where are the smartest people you know all going to work. And when that company comes public, if it craps out post IPO or something, don't buy at the peak, wait till there's a crap out. And you guys should be able to small with a very little amount of your time, just based on your own knowledge, expertise, and relationships, be able to find a few of these beaten down companies, uh, you know, with a small enough amount of money that you're not going to stress about it too much. You mentioned earlier when determining the value of a company that one factor is market sentiment. You know how people feel about the company, and you also mentioned the word supercomputer earlier. Um, so I have a question about that. One, market sentiment seems to be, for lack of a better term, crazy these days. I mean, people look at a company, it'll go up 10% on Tuesday and down 20 on Wednesday. Um, and maybe supercomputers, the way they interfere in the market now, you know, maybe amplifying this by reacting to, you know, momentum, etc. So with the value of a company being so skewed, sometimes over a very long time, uh, is, is value investing harder or, or less effective these days? And is that trend going to continue, in your opinion? It's definitely harder now, but I'm not sure that reflects a long-term fundamental shift. It just tends to be hard when markets are complacent and stocks and markets are at all-time highs, right? But I wouldn't call the market out there crazy. I mean, the multiple of the S&P 500 today is you know, 16 or 17 times. It was well north of 30 times uh, in 1999, for example. That was pure insanity, right? Um, 
Uh, there are pockets of foolishness uh, out there for sure, but it's just you know sort of getting back to your question uh, back there about you know how do you invest in today's world? You know, there's nothing real easy right there, right? I mean, stocks. Uh, you know, if you ask me, the S and P 500. If you just bought an index fund, you're gonna make five, six percent a year over the next ten years. Yeah, it's not horrible. But it's not very exciting, right? But when bonds are offering you virtually nil, uh, you know, um, you know, it's. Um, you just have to. You just can't get discouraged, and you can't get impatient, and you can't swing for the fences. You can't say, you know what, I'm not happy with an index fund. I'm not happy with bonds. So, you know, I'm going to go buy astroturf.com when it comes public, or do something stupid, right? Um, so, you just have to be patient um, and be content. We're in sort of a low return world, so hang out, live beneath your means, save money, and uh, and wait for better opportunities. I mean, to, to your question about the supercomputers, I think what a, what a classic traditional value investor would say is that the fewer decisions about a stock price that are being made by humans, uh, the, the opportunity is actually better because there will be more volatility. Volatility is a good thing. For Value investors tend to find volatility a good thing. So if, if for whatever algorithm-driven reasons, a stock does go down 20 per, it could go up 20% too, but if it does go down 20% on a day because of some news and then the momentum of the stock then forced it down farther than it would go otherwise, if you're, if you're alert, if you're paying attention, if you, if you have a clear sense of what something is worth, you can take advantage of that. So that's what, they, that's what, that's what a classic traditional value investor will say. Now, they won't say it's easy, but the volatility is not something that worries them or bothers them. Value investing historically um, has been compared to a performance uh, of indexes such as the S&P index. Um, and it seems to me as long as they beat the um, market, the S&P index, for example, then value investors are happy. But I, I want to question this a little bit. Um, um, so value investing has been around for a long time, and um, credit should be given to um, people who actually discovered it and pioneered this, Ben Graham, uh, Warren Buffett. But there are now passive solutions. Uh, for example, Dimensionals um, value investing fund was mentioned. Um, so um, isn't that actually a better benchmark to compare against? And a study um, by Larry Spedro, if I remember correctly, comes to mind. And this comparison actually didn't look uh, very good to uh, um, funds that were cited earlier um, in, in the in the survey, Tweedy Brownie, for example. Um, so, uh, do you compare against uh, such benchmarks, and uh, do you think um, value investing is still um, uh, beneficial? It should be pursued. Yeah, well, I guess my first uh, first thought is is I think the studies are correct. Um, mutual funds uh, collectively, uh, as a whole, underperform the market by roughly their amount of fees, uh, plus some trading costs, etc. And hedge funds underperform even more because they're just higher fees and have higher trading costs, right? So collectively speaking, you know, the studies are exactly right. As for which benchmark, um, you know, I choose to use or whatever is, is it depends on how what you're trying to accomplish and what your investors' goals are, right? My investors are all individual investors. Uh, my parents own own nothing except uh, no, no other funds other than mine, uh, and then I've just parked them in index funds for the rest of it, and then some in cash and bonds. You know a little bit of that because they're you know in their 70s and they, they want a little cushion, right? Um, most so most of my investors are individual investors, and their default option is the S&P 500. So that's what I should compare myself to, right? But there are plenty of institutional investors that are looking at a hedge fund that is running a market neutral, they have the same long exposure as short exposure, and they're just trying to be a little more clever on their longs and a little more clever on the shorts to grind out eight to 10% returns. And last year when the market was up 34 and the hedge fund was up 10%, those investors were happy because their alternative was a bond or something cash and they got 10%, and so they're, they, that's, but that's the kind of fund they were investing in that was delivering that kind of performance, right? So, so there's no right or wrong answer here. It's just a question of, of you know, what the fund manager thinks that they're good at and what their strategy is, and, what, and therefore they would say, this is, this is the benchmark we compare ourselves to, and then investors can come in and decide whether that, that's what they're looking for, and then they evaluate the manager to see whether, okay, do I think the manager can, can execute on this and outperform you know, the benchmark? I mean, I, 
I still believe that value investing works and that value investing, it does outperform over time. It has to be executed well, um, but you know, I, believe, I believe it works and I think the, the research would show that executed well, it does work. Now, one can question whether you can find the right people to do it, but to the point, the dimensional funds, those types of things, it is a value investing philosophy that is different than an index. And if you believe in value investing, you could argue that's better than an index. Uh, so this question is about uh, you mentioning that you go an extra step and also look for the reason of the mispricing as to why things have been, John mentioned that in one of his slides. Um, so what is the rationale behind it? Let's say there is a stock which you think is uh, mispriced because of neglect. How does that help? How stringent is this philosophy? Like if you're not able to find a reason, do you just not invest? And uh, I, 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 I think, I, I think um, not everyone would say that. You know, I chose, I chose one of the quotes where he was talking about that he, he really believed that that was important. Um, I think the, the, the thought process is that uh, there are a lot of things you can miss. You know, there may, there may be reasons why like, you missed something and it was going to make the stock go up uh, and you didn't buy it, or it was going to make the stock go down and you didn't, you didn't think of it. So I think it's, it's more of a discipline to identify, not just content yourself with uh, oh, it's cheap, and I don't know why, because you may miss that. You, you, may, you may just miss it. I, 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 I missed something important, and so try to find out why it's mispriced. That's, and not everyone tells me that, but that, I, I chose that one because that was a, that, that, I, heard, I hear that often, and it makes sense to me. Yeah. I mean, look, being, anytime you buy a stock, you're betting against, you're, you're, you think it's cheap, because the market is failing to appreciate. The market thinks something worse about the company than what you think. That's why the stock is trading less than intrinsic, what you believe intrinsic value is. Being very clear and understanding what the market believes is important so that you can figure out what's different. I mean, that would be the problem I would have about investing in Google stock today. Because what do I believe that is so much better about Google than the consensus view? Because the consensus view is, is you guys are awesome, and it's an incredible company, and it has an incredible business model, and it's got great growth opportunities, et cetera. So is my variant perception that I think you're going to grow at 25% a year over the next four years, not 20% a year, or that your margins are, um, I mean, these are theoretical, these are things I would want to test. Or is it my view that uh, 20 or 25 multiple is too low for a company with the world's second or best or world's best or second best economic characteristics and you really should trade at 30 times earnings and the market will figure that out so I'm betting on that or uh, am I betting that your margins are depressed because of these very heavy investments and stuff that's not currently paying a return and that these investments are going to taper down and therefore margins are going to grow a bunch right uh, I got to believe one, some, one of those things to, uh, to buy one of the most widely beloved largest market cap stocks in the world today, right? Uh, so that's probably just in my gut. That's just not what I do as a value investor to think everybody loves this company, but I love it even more. That is just, that rarely is a good investment thesis. And that's not to say you can't make a lot of money doing that, riding you know, great companies, right? But I find it's better for me to find a company uh, that was once covered in glory. Reed Hastings was Fortune's man of the year or something like that when the stock was at $300. And six months later, the stock's down 80%. And I'm thinking, so th now that's interesting. Is this company fundamentally and completely broken? Or did they screw some things up? And are they actually making a really bold bet and foregoing current profitability to drive long -term, uh, a long-term winner-take-all global market that they could dominate? And that's, it's a rational short-term decision to take profitability from $4 a share to $0.20 cents a share in one year to invest to buy streaming content, to make that incredibly bold bet. Amazon's been doing that for 20 years. They've never made a profit because they have a policy of taking every single penny of profit and plowing it back in to future growth. And you know what? The market hasn't destroyed Amazon stock, right? But Netflix, they were selling an earnings growth story. And then they decided, the hell with earnings growth, hell with earnings at all. We're just going to invest in the future. We're going to become like Amazon. 
And all the investors that were in there for the earnings growth story sold the stock. But I was like, you know what? I think this company could be a world beater someday. Uh, you know, so that's, that's more the kind of situation you know, I look for. But being real clear, what does the market believe today? You better believe something different. You better understand what the market believes. And you better be right in what you believe. Yeah. Yeah. So looking at, at a fund as a whole, uh, if you drop 50%, that's a disaster because you got to go 100% up just to get back sure. where you were. In a situation like today where you might think that there's a bubble, uh, I mean, it's hard to find bargains, right? People are very optimistic. What do you do with your, with your, your fund? I mean, how do you, how do you uh, protect yourself against a very large loss, which is much more likely at a situation like now? Right. Well, um, you have a short book. I'm a hedge fund, so I'm short some stocks. And that will hopefully protect me in a downturn. The problem is, is, uh, is shorting is an extremely difficult business. As hard as long investing is, short investing is twice as hard for a variety of reasons. Structural, but also you know, your winners become a bigger portion of your portfolio. Uh, losses are unlimited. Gains are capped, unlike long investing, which is the reverse, et cetera, et cetera. I highly recommend that you never short a stock your entire life. Um, just trust me, I've been doing it for 12 years. I have an entire presentation. I can come back next week. I'll give you my presentation <laughs> on lessons from a dozen years of short selling. I presented at Stanford Business School to Stanford Business School students last night. Um, don't do it. So that then, OK, well, smart guy. Uh, the, the one thing that is sort of obvious, you just have a short book offsetting your long book. Uh, what do you do? Um, the real answer is, is buy super high quality companies uh, that can continue to grow earnings and so forth, even during economic downturns, and you buy them at moderate multiples. Um, and then just be willing to accept that the market pukes out, your stock's going to go down, you know, in line with, maybe in line with the market. Hopefully, if you buy quality companies, the reasonable price is a little less than the market. But you just have to understand, if you're going to invest in stocks, there's going to be volatility. And there is no such thing as a free lunch, where you get equity upside, but you have no risk of downside. So don't invest in stocks if you can't stomach uh, some volatility. Uh, so, so there's no real easy answer there. I don't recommend you short stocks. I don't recommend you go out and buy short-term S&P 500 puts and roll them every month. And, you know, some hedge funds do that, and you're just destroying capital. Um, yeah, generally speaking, during times like this, invest more conservatively, hold more cash, uh, um, it, it, take smaller position sizes. Uh, and, uh, and, and just be patient. The markets come and go in cycles. And being most investors are pro-cyclical. They pile into stocks in October of 07, and then they puke it all out because they can't take the pain in March of 09, right? They piled in in April of 2000. They piled out in uh, October of 2002, right? You know, and, and so investors' portfolios, as a rule, tend to do worse than the overall market because their market timing is so horrible. You need to be counter-cyclical, right? And that's, that's important. You either need to be steady. Look, just put $10,000 every quarter from your IRA. Just put it into an annuity fund just quarterly. It's sort of automatic, and you don't think about it, right? That's a lot better than what most investors do, which is being pro-cyclical. But ideally, you sort of want to be counter-cyclical and just sort of have an instinct. Look, I'm not a full-time investor. I'm doing my job. I'm earning an income. I'm probably not going to get fired. But you know, the market's crapping out. So maybe I'll bump that to 20,000 bucks this quarter and take a little bit of money and put some extra money into the market, right? You know, maybe you put a little bit of less in, right? I mean, if you can do that over a lifetime, that'll help a lot. I wouldn't overestimate your ability to time, however. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I, I, I wouldn't overestimate my, my ability to time. It's very, it's very difficult right. to get that right. Yeah, and, you're 80% of the like, way there if you simply don't screw it up and you just do it steadily, right? And if you're really clever, I, I'm, you know, yeah. being, look, I, I have done in 16 years, I have done well by being aggressive in late 2002, right after 9-11, at the bottom late uh, uh, you know, you can actually, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a public record of it. You can Google Whitney Tilson 60 Minutes, and in December of, 19, of 2008, um, I had correctly predicted the housing, the bursting of the housing bubble, and I was a guest on 60 Minutes about the housing crisis. And I said, I'm piling in, like I'm all in, because as bad as things are out there, stocks are cheap, right? So uh, having that, uh, I mean, I'll tell you, because when you feel like, hiding under your desk with a flak helmet on because every single day your portfolio is blowing up and the headlines are so horrible, right? It's hard to do, right? But 
having being countercyclical like that, a contrarian like that, can add value. But most people can't do it. So at the very least, don't don't screw it up by doing what most people do and piling in at the top and selling at the bottom. We are out of time. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you.